Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. Early voting has ended and election day is tomorrow. For those with mail-in ballots that haven't been sent in, there is still a way to make sure that you vote. Without going to the polls tomorrow, Paul Venema with what you can do. Long lines at polling places tell the story of this election, record-breaking participation. That includes mail-in voting, which was still going on today as many voters dropped off their ballots at election headquarters. For some, it was a matter of waiting this long in order to check out the candidates. I know, obviously, the upper-level candidates, but the lower-level candidates, the judges and things like that, I don't know them that well, so I want to be well informed. Election headquarters is the only place to drop them off to make sure they're counted. That was Rose Pastrano's reason. I didn't get my voting uh, envelope until Saturday, and I wanted to make sure that my vote was in by tomorrow so that it would count. Health issues, the reason that she requested a mail-in ballot. Mail-in ballots can only be dropped off here at election headquarters tomorrow from 7 in the morning until 7 tomorrow evening. No, I just hope and pray that after all of this is over, all of us recognize that we're citizens of the same country, irregardless of party affiliation, and we can learn to get along. All that in case at 12 News. And with just one day to go, both candidates in the race for Congressional District 23 hitting San Antonio hard in the hours before the election. Yesterday, Republican Tony Gonzalez was here for a back the blue rally speaking out against defunding police. Today, Democrat Gina Ortiz Jones bumped elbows and talked issues alongside the Democratic National Committee Chairman Tom Perez, who chose to spend his last day of campaigning here in the Alamo City. In both of these rallies, the candidates each had one same message about division and unity. You can feel the excitement. You can also feel the exhaustion. We are tired of this division. We are tired of this hatred. We're at a point where we are attacking one another. We're dug in, you know, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, shouldn't be that way. We are Americans. Congressional District 23, one of the largest districts in the nation, spanning 58,000 square miles from San Antonio to El Paso. Will Hurd, who currently represents that district, did not seek reelection. Ahead of what many believe to be election of our lives. Some businesses in downtown San Antonio are boarding up their windows and doors on the chance that demonstrations happen and potentially turn violent as we learn the results. For many, this is the second time this year these precautions are being taken. Some businesses had to board up when things turned violent several months ago in the wake of the death of George Floyd. Between prepping for potential problems and being shut down because of the pandemic, some of those working to keep mom and pop shops afloat say they're looking for a break. We are small businesses and we struggle. We put our blood, sweat and tears in it. And, you know, and it's for someone just to take it away in one hour, one evening, it's heartbreaking. Officials we've checked with say they've received no credible threats. However, they tell us there is a safety plan that includes local, state and federal law enforcement agencies, and it will be all hands on deck to respond if needed. We hope you've seen the KSAT stories this year labeled trust indexed fact checking information spanning from COVID-19 to politics. The team that helped us set up our KSAT trust index system belongs to a company called Fathom, which has established a system to monitor misinformation surrounding the 2020 election. Courtney Friedman explains how the co-founders will track false information in real time. Misinformation is inaccurate information spread regardless of malicious intent. Disinformation is deliberately misleading in order to manipulate facts. Both threaten our democracy and will be rampant come election day. Both will also be monitored in real time by Fergus Bell and Tom Trewinard, the co-founders of Fathom, which has monitored elections all over the world. Key terms that we know show up during elections around polling places, around long lines, uh, potential reports of voter intimidation or voter fraud. And what we can do is build complex searches for that that will allow us to monitor over the course of 
three days. There are tools that let us um, do big searches um, across platforms like Facebook. Like disinformation, their work is fast moving. Past elections have prepared them for adaptability. We know some of the tactics that were used in 2016 by bad actors. They were legitimate um, methods of posting ads, for example. We could also expect to see um, some of the same tactics that we've seen before, but in a more uh, refined and advanced way that make it harder for journalists to spot in real time. So, for example, um, the jump in uh, the uh, technology's ability to generate fake faces. And I have to apply some, some new techniques to make sure that we're um, sort of ahead, staying ahead of the curve. While they use fine-tuned methods to spot inaccuracies, they say citizens can use their own filters. Don't share something unless you've read it. It's, there can be a lot of detail behind the headline. It can be emotional and fear-based, um, and it's often tempting, you know, I think even I feel it sometimes, you want to uh, hit share so that your friends and family can see this thing you've just seen. Um, just pause before you do that. So we don't unknowingly become misinformation culprits ourselves. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Our Trust Index team will be very busy on Election Day, but also beyond. If you see something you want our Trust Index team to check out, it doesn't have to be necessarily election related. You can go to ksat.com slash trust index. Let's take a look at time saver traffic right now. This is Balcones Heights here at 410 at Crossroads. You can see traffic moving smoothly on all the on and off ramps as well as the main lanes here. Things darker at this hour at 6.05. New at six, instead of shovels, the San Antonio Housing Authority had a virtual groundbreaking today for its new development, the Legacy at Alison. It's among several others Saha is working on to replace its aging housing projects on the city's west side. Yet Jesse Degollado says Saha's timing and method of marking this occasion is being questioned by some of its critics. This is the land where the Legacy at Alasan will be built. An $18 million Saha project of 88 affordable and market rate apartments opening next fall at the site where this Facebook Live video was shot and produced by Saha. It shows an elaborate altar for Dia de los Muertos created by two West Side artists with the help of the community. This is near and dear to our hearts and to the community. We decided to go with a a heart because it's the corazón. And they use our holiday, Dia de Muertos, to celebrate their deal. But the project's virtual groundbreaking, coupled with the Day of the Dead, is considered disrespectful by those already angry over what they say progress is doing to property taxes in one of the city's poorest areas. And that just is insulting to the community, the, the holiday, and the residents. We're not celebrating these apartments, and you're using the culture of this neighborhood to pretend like you care about the neighborhood. Even the altares and ofrendas put up by Westside families every year at the Rinconcito de Esperanza Arts Center and the community celebration that followed, protesters say could be in jeopardy. Parking and staging for those events had been on the property where the legacy at Alasan will someday stand. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. In response, a spokeswoman for Saha says the organizers of the annual event in the future are welcome to use its community centers and other nearby venues. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight. 67 degrees as we look towards downtown and Adam Kasky is back from the great white north. And I say white yeah. because it is actually white, even though you know you were there in October. It's not supposed to be this time of year. It's not. I go up about every fall to help get the uh, family cabin in northern Minnesota ready for the winter. Get the boat out, get the dock out, winterize, split wood, get ready for the winter. I was in my snow boots and my long johns the entire time this year. It was crazy. Anyway, around here we're below average this morning at 50, 77 by the afternoon high. And then right now, temperatures are already falling off and the sun has set. A time change, hard to get used to. Sun's down 67 degrees, dew point of 28, so very dry air in place. And that means good radiational cooling this evening. Right now we're 72 in Holotus, Bulverde at 69, 67 Stinson and 68 right now in Hondo. And for the most part, we're 70 to near 70 degrees or in the upper 60s, Kerrville in the mid 60s right now. As we go through the evening, temperatures falling off quickly. Clear sky, calm wind will be 56 by 10 p.m. So outdoor activities, you'll want to have long sleeves or that light jacket tomorrow morning. If you're hitting the poles early, 
We'll be in the 40s, so grab a jacket tomorrow morning as well. At sunrise, 47 in San Antonio, 46 Uvalde, 44 in Kerrville, and Gonzales at 46. Then by the afternoon, we warm up pretty uniformly, just well into the 70s, flirting with 80 degrees, probably hitting 80 in Catula, along with Beeville and Laredo. The rest of us, by and large, in the upper 70s by tomorrow afternoon. So expect another sunny day, really more of the same on Election Day. 47 at sunrise here in town, 78 for the high temperature. So in the morning you want the jacket later on in the day by the noon hour. It's one of those days where well, anything goes long sleeves, short sleeves, eh, you'll be OK. Low humidity as well. The humidity is going to change a bit in the days ahead. You're not going to notice it through Friday, but this weekend you'll actually notice a hint of humidity back in the air. By the way, aquifer down 1.3 feet and we're more than seven feet below the November average. Two allergens, mold moderate, ragweed low, seven day forecast coming right up. We are seconds away from the daily briefing on the latest COVID-19 cases here in San Antonio and Bear County. Let's go to City Hall now, now where we're hearing from local leaders. 167 new cases of COVID-19 since yesterday, bringing its cumulative total to 66,231 since the pandemic began. The new seven-day moving average, which is again an accurate picture of how the infection is moving in our community on a daily basis, is now 209. Fortunately, we have no new deaths to report this evening, but we know many of our family members and community members are reeling from a loss of loved one, so please keep them and their families in your prayers this evening. Tonight we have in our hospital system, uh, we are continuing to treat more than 200 patients with 233 in the hospital tonight, including 22 new COVID-19 related admissions over the last 24 hours. We have 96 patients in the ICU and 49 patients on ventilators. It's Monday, so let's take a look at the status of the progress and warning indicators that are guiding our decisions and those of our health professionals. The overall risk level remains moderate with two key indicators moving in the wrong direction. First, that is our 14-day trend for, for new cases, which is now red for severe. Again, our 14-day trend, and we want to see that on a consistent decline, but we have seen a plateauing and now a slight increase, a rebound in the number of new cases as a result of the uptick that started around the second week of October. Second, the positivity rate has jumped nearly a full percentage point again from last week. It's up to 7.7%, up from 6.9% last week. And with the more than 200, 200 COVID-19 patients in the hospital, the risk level remains moderate. Again, uh, I know many of you are doing your part uh, in wearing masks and physical distancing. That is extremely important. In fact, I would venture to bet that most of these numbers would be far worse if we had not been doing that. So keep up the heightened vigilance. Let's work together to protect one another from this disease. And let me turn it over to Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf. Well, you're right about that. With flu season on us, everybody's going to have to be extra, extra careful because we do not want to overload our hospital system uh, with those that may have got the flu or may have got the uh, COVID. Uh, so we just need to be careful. I know, I know everybody's getting tired of this and We've been doing this since March. Can you believe that? Here at seven o'clock every night, uh, but we got We got to keep going. We can't. We can't let up. Uh, the infection rate bothers me, and I'm, I'm concerned. I think we both are. Uh, the hospitalization. Uh, we're doing pretty. Still doing pretty darn good there. You remember we hit that 1,267 in the hospital. It was back on July 12th, I think, and since September the 9th. To November the uh, second now, almost a month, we've kind of gone between 298 cases. I think we got down as low as uh, 185, and we're at 233 today. So we've kept within that range, and that's uh, important that we keep that range there. Now, what's happening to us? We are getting more people from outside. I believe we have 18 patients now from uh, El Paso alone, where they've had a big outbreak. So. Uh, that's kind of pushing on our hospital system uh, to be able to handle people from that far away. As we know, tomorrow's election day. Finally, I'm glad it's here. Uh, we've had a huge vote turnout so far. Uh, we've had 595,000 vote in uh, person, and we think we'll have about another 90,000 when we finish the mail, which brings us to about 640,000. And then tomorrow, uh, we'll probably have anywhere from 125,000 
to 175,000 booths. Now that means that we, we're going to be right at 800,000 or more. That's compared to 550 four years ago, a big turnout. So we want to be ready and assure you it's safe to go vote tomorrow. We'll have 302 voting sites. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, Sheriff Salazar, is uh, gearing up for it to make sure everybody's protected right. Uh, he's put on two shifts, so they'll have two sh full shifts all day long tomorrow. We're not going to be stationed at the poll, but we're going to be close enough if a problem comes up at the poll that we can respond to. Uh, if you have a problem or you see a problem at the poll tomorrow, if you call 210-335-6000, and that's directly to the Sheriff's Office, and they'll be out there uh, to be able to help you. Now, the, both the Police Department and the Sheriff's Department uh, is monitoring social media. I uh, talked to the Sheriff Salazar less than an hour ago, and so far he said they haven't picked up on any threats. Now, you see Houston Street. You know, they're boarding some of that up now, and so we just want to be ready, but go vote tomorrow if you haven't vote. It's going to be safe to vote, and we'll take care of you there. I might mention there's an interesting uh, a Wall Street Journal article today. If you have access to it, you might read it. And it kind of goes into what happens to you when you have COVID and what may be the long-term consequences to you. And that's something that hasn't been a great deal of research on now, and they're starting to do the research, and they're finding people that have had it. Uh, they have uh, fatigue, or they may have digestion problems or cognitive problems uh, down the line. So don't underestimate the seriousness of COVID, not only the number of people that we've lost to it, but people that have had it and may have long-term consequences. Right. Thank you, Judge. And if you are sick or you feel symptoms, please go get tested. Do not go into work or to school uh, if you are feeling sick. That's a critically important part of making sure we don't uh, aid the spread of this infection and we're doing our part to slow it down. All right, so as we look at the numbers that the uh, mayor and the county judge just released tonight, 167 new cases to 66,231. The seven-day average, though, is still above 200 at 209. No new deaths to report, but more than 230 people are hospitalized, and we are at a moderate risk level, especially the positivity rate, something that the mayor brought up. And that has increased from last week. It was at 6.9%. Now it stands at 7.7%. You'll remember for a long time, the goal was to get us below 5% for that positivity rate. We did not stay there very long at all. So that number is trending in the wrong direction, uh, as well as some other indicators that they look at to try to determine our risk level. The 14-day trend of new cases, that's something they want to see a steady decline in. That's not happening right now. That is moving in the wrong direction. Cases are increasing. So the mayor of the county judge just reminding everyone to keep up those precautions uh, that we have been doing for months as we head into flu season and colder temperatures, more people being inside and close together. And the county judge also emphasizing it is safe to vote tomorrow. There's no reason not to vote. Uh, they expect more than 800,000 people to vote in Bear County once it's all said and done. And that's a wonderful that's part that's of the daily a wonderful briefing. number yeah, right that there. That would make us yeah. smile for sure. All right, let's switch to weather right now. Adam Kasky back from his trip north and uh, enjoying, I'm guessing, the <sighs> 60s and 70s that we have here. Usually it's beautiful up north, northern Minnesota this time of year. It was eight degrees on Thursday Ooh. morning. That was nope. colder than when I was there last January. No, thank you. Nope. No thanks, I agree as well. No, it's supposed to be beautiful fall. No, not this year. All right, let's talk about our weather pattern that we have. We've been enjoying some temperatures that have been very fall-like around here, a lack of humidity, and you're not going to notice the humidity until we get into about the weekend. Overall, a lot of sunshine out there. Of course, we've got an upper level high in place. And across the nation, I want to point this out because you know, the weather can really affect voter turnout on Election Day. And tomorrow, we're looking at coast-to-coast -coast sunshine for the vast majority of America. A little bit of precip left over in the New England states and even in the Pacific Northwest, just a touch, but otherwise very sunny and overall comfortable, other than the cool air in New England. I mean, we're 70s from Texas all the way up the plains into the prairie land of North Dakota, Bismarck, even a high of 71. So quiet weather. We've got the upper level high in place. It's right over Texas. There is a disturbance over Southern California. That's causing some desert rain showers, even just north of Vegas and parts of Arizona. That is going to head toward us in the days ahead. 
but unfortunately we don't have all the ingredients together to mix together some showers. Maybe a few morning sprinkles by this weekend, but that's pretty much it in terms of rain. I'm sorry, rain chances are pretty bleak right now. 47 tomorrow morning, but by the noon hour, we'll be in the lower 70s. So long sleeves to start, maybe a light jacket, and then comfortable and sunny in the afternoon. Morning clouds the rest of the week, no big changes temperature-wise, upper 70s to near 80. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, the Texas A&M Aggies are quietly one of the hottest teams in college football right now, Greg. Especially when you consider their only loss was to Alabama so far, but their head coach is issuing a caution tonight. When we come back, you're here from Jimbo Fisher. Also, we come back, it is coming off their biggest win of the season, the Texas Longhorns. Coming up. The fight Texas Aggies have kept their college playoff hopes alive by holding off Arkansas at home this past Saturday, 42-31 to to improve to 4-1. and That's their ninth straight win over the Razorbacks since joining the SEC. And San Antonio's own Kellen Mond was on fire. He went 21-26 for 260 yards and three touchdowns. That has put the Aggies second in the West Division, second only to Alabama, who has given them their only loss. And now they have moved back up to number seven in the country. Head coach Jimbo Fisher doesn't want this recent success getting into his team's head. You got to live up to your own expectations, and that's how you prepare every day. It's how you practice every day. It's how you think. That's what. That's the world where you have to live. And you, and whether you're a, fa you're never a favorite in any game. Listen, everybody in this league can beat you. Everybody's got great players. It's about us preparing, playing, and handling our business one, one game at a time, one day at a time. This week to get in, in position to be able to play on Saturday. And I'm not. That's not a cliche. I mean, that's the way we think. That's the way we believe, and that's the way you have to do it. There are no favorites. There are no underdogs. You just got to play the game and, and be the best you can be. All right, the Aggies will next travel to South Carolina and take on the Gamecocks in a 6 p.m. kickoff. The Texas Longhorns scored their biggest win of the season when they were able to outscore a previously undefeated and six-ranked Oklahoma State 41 to 34 in overtime. The game winner came when Sam Mellinger was able to find Joshua Moore in the 15-yard touchdown to end the game. Not quite, though, but it was junior Joseph Asai who came up with a game-saving sack on fourth down in overtime. It was just part of his career night in which he produced a total of three sacks, one forced fumble, one fumble recovery, six tackles for a loss to go with his 12 tackles. It resulted in the Longhorns' first road win over a top 10 opponents since 2010 and as a result earned him the Walter Camp Defensive Player of the Week as well as a Big 12 Defensive Player of the Week. It was awesome. It was awesome to see the work we had all put in come together. You know, we very easily could have been on the other side of the of the victory. So it was it was awesome to see everything finally click. You know, I I watched all week the work we put in and I'm very glad that it, that, that, that we were able to come out with a win. All right, next up for the Horns, who are back in the top 25 at number 22, will host West Virginia and Austin 11 a.m. Saturday. You see that game live right here on KSAT 12. For the first time since Jeff Trailer was hired as a new head coach of UTSA, the Roadrunners failed to score a touchdown. In fact, starting quarterback Frank Harris was sacked four times in the 24-3 loss to Florida Atlantic, dropping the Roadrunners to 4-4 four four overall and 2-2 two and two in Conference USA. Still the nation's leading rusher, Sincere McCormick, was held to just 54 yards and just 16 carries, and that was a big factor as well. One X for the nation is that the Roadrunners are playing with their seventh different starting lineup on the offensive line due to the COVID and injuries. But... Now it's about finishing the final four. This needs to be a November to remember. Uh, and we have a real chance to make a statement uh, these last four games. Now, they're four good teams. Uh, Rice is way better than they have been. And uh, they're a very veteran group with a lot of players returning. You can tell they're just big, strong, physical kids. And the Roadrunners will try and get back on that winning track when they travel to Houston to face Rice Saturday at 2.30. Florida head coach Dan Mullen has been fined $25,000 and issued a reprimand for the grift of the SEC after that massive brawl that broke out after the first half of the Gators game against Missouri. Florida players thought the hit on their quarterback Kyle Trask at the end of the first half was unwarranted, and that's when the two teams went at it. Florida defensive lineman Zachary Carter, linebacker Antoine Powell were ejected for the remainder of that game, will now miss the first half of Florida's game against Georgia. It escalated quickly and it was tough to get them separated. It's an ugly scene. Mm. Very ugly. That's what it was. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. We are kicking off our special election eve coverage coming up.
Well, welcome back. It is election eve and there are a lot of important races up and down the ballot that we're watching. So we are kicking off our 2020 election coverage right now. For the next hour and a half, we'll be speaking with political experts about what we'll be looking for on election day, breaking down some of the biggest races and possible implications. You can watch on KSAT 12 until 7 p.m. and then at 7, you can continue to watch this stream on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app. Myra and Steve will kick off our coverage right now in the studio. Thank you, ECs. He is the most high profile Republican in Bear County elected office. He's a former San Antonio City Councilman. He is a current Bear County Commissioner, but he is not running for re-election. He is always very honest with his takes on Election Day, and I always appreciate that. We are joined by County Commissioner Kevin Wolf. Uh, you know, I don't want to date both of us here, but you know, you're one of my first guests when we started the this election night live stream eight years ago. So I, I wow. appreciate you coming on and giving us your opinion. What Absolutely. what races are you watching locally and statewide? Sure. So, well, obviously, I'm very interested in the precinct three commissioner race. So I've been keeping a close eye on that. And quite frankly, all the races happening in precinct three as a whole. And so, if you want some some quick shots uh remember our precincts are divided up equally in population so precinct three represents roughly 500,000 people however uh 40 percent of the total vote right now is coming out of precinct three so while we while we only make up 25 percent of the population we end up making up 40 percent of the vote uh, and what I'm seeing there is um, it's looking pretty good for uh, Steve Allison. I think it's looking good for Trish DeBerry for commissioner. Um, I think it's a little weak for uh, Chip Roy uh, in Congressional District 21. Uh, and then I'm seeing some real weakness for uh, Tony Gonzalez in Congressional District 23. Uh, so that's my long way of saying that uh, as far, far as Bear County as a whole is concerned, it's probably not going to be a really good night for, for those of us who say we're Republican. Uh, I think you're going to see a pretty strong Democratic turnout. You certainly saw that in the beginning of, of early vote, uh, where the first few days were uh, primarily D votes. Uh, that's leveled off, especially in Precinct 3 over the over the length of time. But what you're seeing is a huge turnout, Steve. I can't tell you, you know, this will be, we'll break all records here. We've already had over 600,000 in early vote. Add to that another 80,000 in mail-in that we've gotten. If you figure 30% uh, are going to vote in total on election day, then that means we're going to break somewhere around 950,000 votes. That's incredible. We're, we're really eager to see how those numbers shake out tomorrow, as well as, of course, the results. So do you think that those record shattering numbers of voter turnout are going to play in the Democrats favor as a whole? Or, or what's your feeling on that? So if, if I if I listen to, uh, no, you know, no offense intended, but if I listen to media, uh, it's it's a big Democratic wave. However, I listened to that in 2016 and I, I like everyone else I seem to talk to, was convinced that Hillary Clinton was going to win until about 930 election night. So I, I, I've, I've sworn off trying to handicap races since that time. Uh, I think what we're really seeing is, yes, you're seeing a, a large turnout of Democratic voters. Um, however, I also think, and they don't get enough credit for it, you're seeing a large of uh, what has been referred to as the silent majority coming out. So whether or not those two cancel each other out, I guess we'll find out for sure tomorrow. Well, how, cl how close do you think the race for your position will be between Christine Hortick and Trish DeBerry. We talked about Precinct 3. You talked about the sure. large voter turnout. It has to be in part because that's a hotly contested race. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I, I have I have felt a, a little bit for for Trish. Uh, she's actually been, you know, constantly running for over a year now. But uh, I'll give you some specific percentages that I'm predicting. Uh, 53, 47 for Trish. Interesting. That's a little that, that's a very heavily Republican district, though. So it is. that's probably it as is. close as anybody that ever ran against you, that, I'm guessing. That will exactly right. That it, that will be the closest uh, that it 
has ever been in Precinct 3. And, you know, we, we talk about and we do gerrymander at the state level. Well, guess what? We also gerrymander at the local level, except that it's on the reverse. So, yeah. you know, the commissioner's court has tried to make sure that Precinct 3 is packed with all the Republicans so that the other seats get elected as D's. Let's talk about the race in Precinct 1. That's going to be a big change for the commissioner's court. Outgoing uh, Commissioner Chico Rodriguez. Yep. That will be a new face that we haven't seen for a long time in that precinct. What's your take on that race? Yeah, you know, so I, I think I think what's good overall uh, is that we are going to see some some major changes on on the court and bringing some some new blood in. Uh, I haven't got to meet with with Becky personally, but I'm hearing good things about her, uh, especially in regards to how smart she is uh, and how she really wants to hit the route ground running. Uh, it will she will be a very different commissioner than uh, Commissioner Chico Rodriguez. Um, it's, you know, the, the way it works, certainly at the local level, uh, whether it's on commissioner's court or city hall for that matter, is how well you can work with the folks that you serve with. And, you know, there's two rules. If you're on city council, uh, you have to be able to count to six in order to get anything done. If you're on commissioner's court, you have to be able to count to three to get anything done. And so it will be interesting to see how, how uh, Becky, uh, assuming she, she wins, and I think she will, that's a very strong democratic precinct. Um, We'll, it'll it'll be interesting to see how she mixes with uh, Justin Rodriguez and Commissioner Calvert and the county judge. All right, I know you're going to join us tomorrow, but I want to get a qu quick question in about 20 seconds left. Okay. You're not going to just ride off into the sunset. You're not just going to be a Stetson <laughs> open road model. Tell me, tell me what is going to happen next for Kevin Wolf. So, you know, Steve, real quickly, you know, A, I never thought I'd, I'd be in office and I certainly didn't think I'd be in it for 15 years. So, you know, need to take a break. I want to go out, work on business, family, those types of things. Uh, does that mean I will never run for office again? Uh, well, like I said, I didn't think I'd ever run for office. So I can tell you definitively, I'm not saying I won't ever run for office again. I will stay very much involved, certainly as 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 Joe's citizen, uh, but there may come a time when when I decide to run for something else. All right, leaving the door open. Outgoing Precinct 3 Bear County Commissioner Kevin Wolf, a much different election day for you tomorrow. Pressure's off. Enjoy. That's it. <laughs> we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it guys. as always. After the break, I'm going to join ECs in the newsroom. We're going to be talking to UTSA political science professor Sharon Navarro about the importance of the Latino vote. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our election eve preview of what we are looking for tomorrow. And we are joined by UTSA political science professor Sharon Navarro now. Professor, thank you for joining us. Uh, you look at numbers and you look at minority voting numbers and kind of try and break that down. What are you seeing so far this year when it comes to specifically the Latino vote? Well, it looks like the Latino vote is very energized about uh, getting out uh, to the polls. Uh, we're seeing about 65% uh, for Biden or leaning towards Biden uh, and about uh, 25 to 30% leaning towards Trump, um, which means it should be a pretty interesting election. Speaking about turnout, there's this notion that Latinos historically have had low turnout rates for elections, despite being a big part of the electorate. Is this true? And if so, why is that? Uh, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is uh, the lack of education, the importance of not just registering to vote, but actually going out to vote and what it means to be a good citizen. Uh, the second is uh, habits. Uh, Latinos have not gotten into the habit of going in voting on a regular basis. And the third factor has to do with outreach. Uh, some parties believe that the you know, Latino vote really doesn't matter uh, and don't make much of an effort to uh, do outreach. And what do you, what do you I'm, I'm sorry, what do you think uh, Latino vote, vote, uh, vote turnout will look like this year to kind of follow up on that? Uh, Latino votes in past elections have ranged between 9 to 12 percent. I would venture to say we're maybe hit about 18 uh, percent during this presidential election. Wow, that's interesting. I, I also want to talk to you about are, part, are the Republicans and Democrats doing enough? Are they doing anything differently this time around than they've done before? I think they're doing the same uh, that they've done in the past. Micro-targeting occurs within the last six weeks of an election. Uh, we're hearing them talk about the issues that are important to Latinos. 
Uh, so it's sort of more of the same, uh, but right now, because of the pandemic, it feels more uh, that there's a sense of urgency. Much more with Dr. Sharon Navarro right after this. And we are back with UTSA political science professor, Dr. Sharon Navarro. And Dr. Navarro, right before the break, you mentioned the pandemic. I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, it's certainly taken a heavy toll on communities of color and especially the Latino community here in San Antonio. Do you, do you expect this to activate voters come tomorrow? Absolutely. There's a sense of urgency that we haven't seen in past elections. Uh, COVID is affecting marginalized communities like blacks and African or blacks and Latinos, uh, and uh, it, it makes them want to get out uh, to sort of change their future situation. This is something that we, we, we do a Bear Facts poll uh, every quarter here at KSAT along with Bear Facts and the Rivard Report and Out San Antonio Report. One of the things we noticed is when it comes to certain issues, it's hard to say, you know, just people of color or even Latinos, it, it's, they're not really voting as a block. I mean, it seems to almost break down demographically. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's something you've studied this. How does it break down in what you've noticed? Uh, when you look at the Latino community, it's not monolithic. Uh, Cuban Americans vote differently than Puerto Ricans, than Mexican Americans and Salvadorans and so on and so forth. And within those groups, you have the age or generational differences that have to be taken into account uh, when we talk about voter outreach and, of course, gender differences. So it's, it's like peeling an onion. There's layers. You mentioned generational differences. I want to ask you our next question out of that, but we're going to toss to break really quickly. We'll be right back with Dr. Sharon Navarro. We are back with UTSA professor Dr. Cher Navarro for our discussion on the Latino vote. And Dr. Navarro, I want to ask you, before the break, you mentioned that generational divide and generational differences. Latinos are one of the fastest growing minority populations in the country. How do you see the Latino electorate shaping up in the future? Oh, every 30 seconds, a Latino turns the 18. That means it's become, it can be a large voting block. So this is a group that's up for grabs. They'll go out and vote. They'll support the candidate that they believe speaks to their issues and they are loyal voters. So this is an incredible opportunity for either party to go after the Latino electorate. Do you think Donald Trump's doing better with minorities than uh, maybe Republican candidates of the past? Uh, he's uh, polling about the same as uh, previous presidential candidates with the exception of George Bush too, that polled uh, closer to the 30s to the 40s. Right now he's about 27 and he got about the same uh, percentage uh, last presidential election. Do you think, is there a reason why? The, that he's pulling about the same? Yeah, or that, uh, he's, that, he's, that, he's, that, he's, that people seem to be attracted to Donald Trump. Uh, they like his uh, bravado, his sense of the security that he projects. And right now if we did, were to do a gender breakdown, 35% uh, of males between the ages of 18 and 49 uh, prefer Donald Trump as opposed to uh, Joe Biden. Uh, those uh, with above the age of 50 uh, are projecting about 35% of the Latino, Latino vote. So it's more of the masculine uh, law and order type uh, personification that he projects. Certainly going to be an interesting day tomorrow. Dr. Sharon Navarro, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Invaluable insight. Thank you, Doctor. Absolutely. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're just a few seconds away from switching to just online only. Right now we're on air and online, and we're going to go through a lot of the races that we will be watching in particular tomorrow night. And helping us navigate through that, the Express News political columnist, Gilbert Garcia, and the CEO of SA 2020, Molly Cox. We're very excited for this next segment coming up here. Yeah, a lot of important races that we're following. They're here to provide their expertise and their insight. Again, we're going to sign off here shortly on air, and then you can follow us on KSAT.com as well as the KSAT TV streaming app. Then we will let Molly and Gilbert speak, we promise. <laughs> we'll see you online we'll see you next. Online. <laughs>